Hello and welcome to Library Land Conversations. This is our opportunity to highlight and learn from really smart and dedicated people in the library ecosystem. And uh, in many ways, these conversations started out with a, a, a way during the pandemic for us to um, continue to explore libraries. Um, we really missed the opportunity to talk to library workers and folks who play roles in libraries. Um, and even how libraries are designed and built. And, um, you know, all these roles are different, but every one of these people we've met has just demonstrated this uh, uh, love of libraries and, and how they function and a reverence for the institution. So we really enjoy sharing the stories with you and, and thanks for tuning in today. Um, and, uh, Let's let's uh, I'll pass it over to Greg, my co-host. And uh, if I didn't introduce myself, I'm Adam Zand, president of Library Land Project. And I'm Greg PC, executive director of Library Land Project. So, guys, um, today we're really excited to welcome you here. Uh, you know, you are the two principal architects uh, from a firm that's totally blown us away. Uh, Odin Zello has just been something that we've been impressed by over and over again. I, I think since 2017, uh, Adam and I have visited, well, we've more than 300 libraries, uh, many of which, or not, several of which uh, were designed by, by the two of you. And one of them, um, the Gladys Kelly in, in Webster was the first library we visited that we really just, it, it brought you to our attention and gave us uh, just a, a real respect for the for the work. Thank you. We're, we're proud of that project. So I, I don't know if we formally introduce you or informally introduce you. So today we're joined by the two principals of the firm, uh, Matthew Odens and Conrad Ello. And um, I, I, you know, it's funny, Greg, I, I first learned about these guys, or at least the firm. Um, I was on the social media channels and we did something about Webster, you know, something glowing. And um, either there was a comment or a, uh, a, a thank you or a repost. And I was like, oh, I wonder, um, the, the firm really likes what we wrote. So I, I, I reached out to you and eventually we reached out to them. And um, we found ourselves uh, at least two or three times in their south end of Boston um, office. And um, you know, today we're just wanna kind of continue those conversations but in a little different way. So once again, back over to, uh, to, to Greg, but thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having us, Adam. Uh, Matt Conrad, thank you again. Uh, give us a little bit of background on yourselves, how you, how you got into the work that you do and specifically how you've ended up doing such great work for public libraries. Uh, well, you know, we, we both have, Conrad and I have different stories, although um, our, uh, our friendship goes back many years. We were actually both students at University of Virginia together. Um, and also, I think we agree uh, that one of the most special, most sort of influential uh, uh, aspects of that program was their Italy uh, study abroad program. Uh, both Conrad and I did the, their Vicenza Italy summer program um, and, you know, remained in touch over the years, both went off to grad school, ended up in different firms, ended up finding ourselves back in Boston uh, at the same time and ended up working together at the same firm, Machado and Savetti, for about 10 years together, uh, where we were a couple of the senior managers of that firm and, you know, got to a point where it was it was the right time for us to to strike out on our own, which we did in 2007. Um, and, you know, try really trying to build on the same kind of work that we had been doing for cultural institutions, primarily higher ed, uh, arts related projects, museums um, at our old firm and tried to build on that experience as we were trying to carve out a name for ourselves uh, with a new firm. Yeah, I'll add that um... 
Matt was uh, fortunate enough to be the project architect when we were at Machado and Silvetti um, for the Boston Public Library's Alston branch. Um, that was now more than 20 years ago. And uh, in a way that we, that's really, we sort of parlayed that experience and that strength, you know, into a, a practice that, that had a strength and focus in, in library design. Um, you know, I'll add that, uh, you know, we got, we started our practice in 2007, the year before the, what's now called the Great Recession. And, you know, for a few years there as a young practice with absolutely no built work under our belt, you know, we had to fall back on that experience and that, uh, you know, at our, our time at Machado and Silvetti and, um, you know, pitch that to the best ability to potential clients. And fortunately for us in 2009, a small town out in Western Mass, Shootsbury gave us a chance with a, with a library study. And really we built, uh, we built our, our, our body of library work from there. We really, that was sort of the catalyst for, for moving us in that direction. Sadly, uh, uh, that that project didn't go forward. They they were like a lot of libraries in Massachusetts, um, competing for state funding through the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners construction grant program. Um, and al although they received a grant, in fact, they were I think you know one of the top ranked. Um, uh, communities to apply that year, even though they received the grant, they weren't able at town meeting to approve uh, matching those funds. Um, the grant typically gives about a 50% uh, 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 grant towards the cost of construction. And I think in the case of Shootsbury, it was one of the highest awards ever given. It was closer to 70%, I think. Uh, and they do it based on need. So it was a clear, you know, um, identification that this was a community that, that really desperately needed uh, an improved library. And uh, unfortunately, they weren't able to, to pass at a town meeting. Uh, but as Conrad said, it was really, you know, it was a sort of first step in the, uh, in the right direction, a foot in the door to have a library project under our own name. Um, you know, the, the Alston Library was a, was a fantastic experience um, working with a great institution like the Boston Public Library. It was the first library that I had worked on. In fact, it was the first project that I worked on uh, when I was hired at Machado and Silvetti. And um, I think a certain amount of um, sort of fresh look, maybe a little, even a little bit of naivete, uh, I, I think in the end is, is not a bad thing when it comes to, you know, exploring a building type like that. And um, I think that was... I think we were able to distinguish that building from other branches and it was very successful because of that. And I think we tried to take a similar approach um, as we started designing libraries on our own and thinking about the things that were important to us as designers of, of building of public buildings. Um, and, and maybe not necessarily what we see when we go to, you know, benchmarking visits of, of the sort of typical town library. And so, we, you know, we got into it sort of hoping we could bring a slightly different perspective maybe to the design of libraries. I had no idea that library was that, was 20 years old. Yeah. I mean, it's, it feels, it, it continues to feel so contemporary um, and so current, but it, I, I, I didn't realize it was that old. So that was the, the, the genesis in some ways. You know, we obviously just visited you uh, in Norwell. Uh, and so it, it's, you know, how has the design sensibility changed as you've gone from that first project to your, your, your most recent and soon to be opened? Um, I mean, you know, like anything you, as you gain experience, you, um, you, your the way that you see that project changes uh, too. You, you, you bring lessons learned from other projects. You have a a more thorough, a deeper understanding of the way that building needs to work. And so I think, you know, I, I guess I would say that over the last 10 years really of, of uh, designing libraries for us, we have kind of figured out certain things that work well, things that don't work. And, and we can bring that from one project to the next. Uh, you know, we don't have to sort of relearn things, but, but we do try, um, and this is true really in, in all of our projects, we bring um, a, a freshness to a project. We don't go in with a 
necessarily a preconceived idea of what it's going to look like. We don't have a, a style. We don't, you know, go in and say, it's got to be this, you know, we really want to do this type of building this time around. And we look at the site and we, you know, uh, sort of look at that context. We, we look beyond the limits of the site, in fact, to see, you know, what are the, the other influences on this project that are a little further away. I think Webster is a good example of that, um, uh, you know, thinking about how it, about its role as, a, as an important building in the center of town and how it could strengthen uh, this, the town green and its relationship to town hall and, and do things that the original library in that same location, in our opinion, always fell a little bit short of. And so we, you know, we still try, I think, to bring that to our projects, regardless of, of type. I think we've also learned that the, at least in the library as a building type, the integration of kind of architecture with interior design, which includes, you know, furnishings, call it, you know, furniture, wall coverings, colors, you know, is absolutely critical. And, you know, we were talking, touching on, Matt just mentioned Webster. I think Webster was really the first library we did that truly integrated those two aspects of library design fully under our control. And, um, you know, what the main issue there is that I think you being able to bring interiors into the design discussion earlier in the process so that it becomes a driver to design is really critical as opposed to overlaying that information, that kind of detail after the fact. And so, um, you know, we, I think we've learned that as a, as a critical lesson. And as we move forward with new clients, um, you know, we, we were able to demonstrate with Webster a sort of power of that kind of integrated design that um, I think is really, really important um, in particular to this building type. One of the things that really blew us away about Webster, I mean, we didn't know who had done the work when we arrived there, but just the feeling of kind of an integrated uh, vision of, of, of the space, you know, the lighting, uh, the acoustic design, we were just like, this is, this is something different than, than we've seen. Um, you know, how did the community respond to those kind of design concepts? And then how have you parlay those into, into future work and, and have people been as receptive and as appreciative? Yeah, you know, I, um, I've, I've told the Webster committee many times that we'd like them to offer uh, client training programs, like a boot camp for clients, because they, they really were, um, they were probably one of the easiest clients to work with. We, they, they trusted us, which I think is a big part of any uh, relationship. And, um, and they were open to ideas and, you know, they, they weren't always unanimous. They didn't, you know, not every member of the committee liked every aspect of the design along the way, but they, they were respectful of each other and of us. And it was a, a you know, a discussion and we would uh, talk about ideas and we'd, you know, look at a range of ideas and sort of coalesce around, you know, a, a, a single vision for the library. And um, they were always very positive, very supportive, and they had clear aspirations, I think, about what that building should be, maybe not so much about what it should look like, but but what it should do for the town and um, what kind of what kind of image it should convey, not not stylistic image, but um, what does it say about about the town of Webster and about you know the the importance of libraries and, and community um, and so I think that that really came through and um, it, it was a terrific uh, experience for us and I, I think in the end they were very happy too you know it was just a, a good process all around. That's, that's great. Um, I. I, you know, we've been to a lot of your libraries and I, I want to talk about some of the details. As Greg says, we walk in now and we're like, oh, I, we sort of get it. We understand that this is an element of the firm. So how about just a brief story or um, uh, that we've seen uh, on our travels and, and how these elements function? So I'll just throw them out if one of you wants to react to them. If two of you want to react, all the better. Uh, the first one would be the Reader's Porch in Situate, Situate, Mass. Um, 
we like that reader's porch as well, Adam. Um, you know, all of our projects, you know, whether it's a library or a museum or, or some other type of pu public or cultural building, you know, Matt and I and our firm um, really strives to kind of make meaningful connections between the building and the site, you know, be it to expand program outside or to take in a view or even in an urban context to be a, a better kind of civic neighbor. Um, and I will say that when we first started working on public libraries in the Commonwealth, working with the MBLC and towns, um, there, there was a real resistance to um, incorporating outdoor space and outdoor programming into to public libraries. You know, as you can imagine, municipal, municipalities are always struggling with, you know, limited staff and limited and you know, an outdoor space is just one more, um, one more thing to maintain, which, which has, it's been a struggle, but I think we've seen a change in the last 10 years. And I think the pandemic will interestingly, hopefully expand that idea of outdoor programming and space, you know, being a more important part of, of library design. Uh, but uh, the, the Situate Porch, I think is a perfect example of, of kind of a low maintenance space that, you know, provides an opportunity for the building to connect to its park-like setting. If you've been to Situate, you know that that building overlooks a really beautiful, I don't know, five acre um, green space with playing fields and you know big mature, mature trees. Um, so you kind of take advantage of that. You take advantage of nice weather in, in shoulder seasons to, to sit out there with a book all within the kind of secure confines of the library. So you know, no problem bringing books out and, and enjoying that space um, while, while truly being in that, in that secure um, environment. So that, that's part of it. Uh, you know, it, 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 it operates well in that, in that ability to connect with, with the park. But, um, you know, we also feel like libraries need to be comfortable spaces that people want to um, linger in and come back to. And so offering amenities like that where, you know, why not? Why wouldn't you want to sit out in a, you know, with a nice breeze on a porch overlooking a park um, and linger? So for us, that those types of spaces are really important in buildings. And I think why can't public libraries have more of that? We've seen, you know, some other designers do uh, similar things. I think the Austin Central Library is a great example of, of a, a, a building, a public building that has great outdoor space. And, and we try to, you know, push our clients to to think about that in, in, in all of the libraries that we do. Uh, that's and, awesome. And, and, and having a, uh, just a, a swinging, a, a swing that you can sit in out, outside like that, that, you talk about those sort of special destination sort of uh, experiences when it comes to libraries. So we, we want to go back there and do that. Uh, sorry, you, you were going to say, you were going to add. No, I, I was just going to uh, mention the swing. Um, that, there's a nice little story behind that as well. That was the, I think it was an Eagle Scout project for a local Boy Scout. And that's another nice uh, thing to, uh, that a, a nice, you know, byproduct of being designers at public libraries and working with towns like that is, is getting involved with different, with the community in more direct ways on design projects. So that was one, I think they designed the bike rack as a, shape a of a shark you know yeah. there's some cool little details that i think made the grounded the library and its community a little bit more directly it's cool we, Matt, we've gotten uh, good, sorry i was just going to say we've gotten good feedback too from uh from libraries and communities for those kinds of spaces you know the first one we did actually was a children's porch um covered outdoor porch at the west hisbury library on martha's vineyard and um, apparently it was so popular that the adults were trying to figure out how to get out there, even though we had actually created a terrace for adults on the opposite side of the building, there was something about being under this porch that, that was really attractive. And, um, you know, I, I actually have taken my daughter there for story time. Uh, you know, when she was a toddler, we would sit that sit out there and it's a, it's, it's really a, a lovely way to, to, uh, engage with the library outdoors. You know, we've, as Conrad said, we we try to bring that sensibility to really all of our projects. That some type of connection to outdoors, whether that's uh, vis just visual or it's physical as well. And you know, in Norwell, the Norwell Public Library, which you just visited, uh, we really doubled down on the the courtyard and porch idea. And you know, I've I've always been a sucker for a courtyard building. 
Um, so we there we were able to do a building organized around a central courtyard that's also a rain garden. It's in a wetland. And so uh, dealing with stormwater is very difficult. And so that became a kind of central stormwater collection um, and filtering garden, you know, where it then uh, flows from there back out to the wetlands. Uh, but we also developed two porches, a screen porch and an open porch in that library. Um, you know, for the same reason, this, this is a, Norwell is an incredibly unique setting for a library. It's in the middle of the woods, not visible uh, from the outside, not, you know, you, from the main road. Uh, you don't see any other buildings when you're there, just trees and deer. And so it's unusual to have a public building in a context like that. And, and we really wanted to celebrate that. And in the end, that, that building was kind of designed from the inside out. You know, we, it was all about the experience of how you get there, where, you know, getting from your car into the building, what do you experience, um, you know, coming in low, emerging into these taller rooms with, uh, you know, large expanses of glass and, and sort of finding yourselves in the, in the main reading rooms then overlooking this incredible context. Um, and that, you know, the, the site is a really powerful um, contributor to, to the experience. So, um, so we, we like to celebrate that as much as we can. Awesome. So, so thanks for the, the Norwell addition there. That, that, that's pretty cool how they, in some ways, the projects kind of connect. I hadn't thought about that. Um, and, and we're concurrently to this conversation, we're actually working on a blog post of, of that visit to Norwell. So uh, we'll, we'll direct people to that. I want to stay in situate for one second. What I, I love about your designs is the use of natural lighting. Um, and I'm, I'm struck by the roof in situate. Can you, can you talk about like the general topic of lanterns and, and natural light? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take this one. Um, I assume you both know that situate is a renovation. It's actually a renovation and expansion of, of a, um, a, a public library that was designed by a local architect back in 1978. And that building had a massive hipped roof that, you still see that today, but it was it was that roof form without the lantern, uh, which we added. Um, and that big, massive hipped roof spanned over a very deep floor plate. So um, in our case, you know, we, we went into that building without the lantern, the space underneath it, especially in the middle of the building, sort of relied very heavily on electric lighting. It didn't help that the stacks were full height stacks that limited views then of, of um, the, the, the few windows that were there out on the perimeter. So in our, our case with the lantern, we sort of saw that opportunity um, to really bring daylight into the heart of the building. Um, and, and what you experience today, and this is the, the really gratifying because we hear from patrons that use the library pre-renovation and, and, and use it now that it, it's true, it's wholly transformed the, the experience of that library. So as you go into it, into it, the lantern brings daylight, you know, into every corner of that building. And there was nothing we could do about the fact that, you know, that floor plate was as wide as it was. I think generally speaking, we like to design buildings that, you know, every space in the building is a little closer to a perimeter window, to a view, um, to daylight. And so in this case, it was kind of a unique design problem because you were you had to kind of deal with this fixed artifact, um, and the lantern was kind of a perfect device to to really energize it. I'll, I'll say so. Um, we we took a trip out to Cape Cod to do several libraries, and um, the timing actually worked out to go to Eastham, and just a uh, um, we we did an interview actually out there, and just some of the beautiful natural light that came in. But we, we had a study room downstairs and, you know, we're, we're sort of doing a mini tour and we wound up in the children's area uh, at the Eastham Library. And can you talk a little bit, one of you or both of you, about how that space sort of continues um, the, out, the outside ground and a nearby pond? Yeah, um, so the, the Eastham Library is an interesting one. It's on, a, it's on one of the Capes kettle ponds, you know, these deep kettle ponds. Um, and so, you know, like uh, Norwell, but not quite uh, as extensive, but like that, there's su such a nice natural beauty that we really wanted to take advantage of that the previous library really didn't. Um, 
And, and at the same time, we were trying to improve that site. There, there used to be parking between the library and the pond. Um, and so as part of this project, we, we relocated parking up to the side of the road and reestablished the 100-foot wetland buffer from the pond all the way up to the building. And so we wanted the building to, to push right up against that 100-foot buffer um, on a hillside overlooking that pond and really uh, take advantage, take full advantage of that, uh, that view and, uh, and, and that relationship to, uh, to its context. And um, you know, I, I would say that we focused initially more, frankly, on the main level, um, which is which is grade at the street. Uh, and as the as the ground falls away, you expose the lower level beneath that. But the main level, very tall windows overlooking the pond where where the adult collections are, um, had sort of been our primary focus. And the thinking about the children's area, which is down on the lower level was that they would then have access to outdoor space. And so both adults and children have access to, to outdoor space. The, the adults, the, the building is sort of loosely organized around a kind of you know, semi-enclosed courtyard on the main floor. Um, and then down at the lower level, the children's room spills out at grade to a terrace and a meadow uh, landscape that, that sort of runs down into the, the wooded edge between the building and the, and the pond. Um, and, and I have to give credit to the library staff who really um, wanted to, to they, they loved the idea that there was this strong connection and that that was something that we were excited about. And they really wanted to, to do whatever they could to bring that uh, kind of meadow and pond ecology into the building. And so they insisted that we use green carpet and they picked a custom blend of greens that, you know, th that would... Uh, Sort of pick up the meadow grass, and they insisted that the walls be painted blue. And you know, so there's a very literal um, uh, extension of of the natural landscape into that space. And it's, I think, in the end, it's very successful. It's um, there's e space. even a even a pond themed uh, circulation desk. Um, so they, you know, they, um, they, I think, they sort of uh, as much as we did appreciated that context and, and wanted to celebrate that as much as possible. And it, it does feel uh, terrific. You know, you, you worry about uh, putting program down in a lower level that it not feel like a basement. It really does feel uh, bright and connected to that site. And uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful spot in a different way than the main floor is. Um, I want to ask you about one closer to me. I, I live in, in Medway and the Millis Library. One of the things that we've seen and liked about that are the those little reader's nooks that look out uh, out through windows uh, into the community. Um, and we obviously have seen that also uh, to a certain extent in, in Norwell, that, that, that idea of, of creating, and, and also in uh, Easton, creating a, a place for people to be in the library, uh, but still connected to the exterior. Conrad, do you want to take that one? Yeah, I mean, I think it's important uh, for buildings to offer a kind of gradation of, of public and private space. And, uh, but, you know, in the same way that we think the reader's porch at Situate offers folks a, a kind of welcoming and cozy uh, spot to come back to, um, you know, we think it's important to have these intimate spaces uh, that, are, you know, you can cozy up with a book. Um, in the case of Millis, there's a great uh, little periodicals alcove that has a, a gas fireplace. And, um, you know, we, we did that at Situate as well. We've done, we do that actually East Ham has a, an area with a fireplace. We, we seem to try to pitch that as much as we can in our buildings. Um, but it's, I think it's important that you have spaces that you can get away from, um, from others in a building and, and, and really, you know, get lost in your own little world. And I think that's especially important um, in the contemporary library, today's library, because they're they're operating more as you know de facto community centers and less less as repositories for books. So instead of getting lost in the old stacks, you know you you need to provide these little alcoves and areas that are a little more contemplative and and intimate, um, because so many other things are going on in a library today. It's also a nice counterpoint to the scale of, 
you know, a main reading room. Like if you think about, you know, a library is an important civic building. It's a, it's a community center. And so it's a, um, it's, it's a sort of softer civic, uh, softer side of civic architecture, right? It's more uh, accessible. It's a little more welcoming. Um, but, but there, but there is a, a civicness to them. And, and we have always felt like that needs to be reflected in some way in the design, whether that's, you know, a, a porch like at, at the library in Webster, which is a, a civically scaled porch. It's a two-story high porch that's sort of referencing the giant order porch, uh, more classical version of that same idea on the town hall next door. But there is a scale there that says, hey, this is a this is an important building for the town um, and it has a kind of civic scale. And so inside, we also like creating spaces that have some of that civic scale to them. And, you know, you think about great reading rooms like the Bates Room at the Boston Public Library, the main branch. Um, you know, and I think the scale of some of our spaces, the you know, that main room in Situate is, is a great example. The East Ham Library. Norwell, very similar, um, the, you know, the adult reading rooms, Millis do, um, are, are quite large. And there's something about that scale that feels appropriate, but you need a respite from that. You know, as Conrad said, you need a place to, to kind of escape, not just from the noise, but from the scale of that and have a place that feels a little more sheltered where it, it's easier. Not, it may not be quieter, but it feels more private and, and it's a, easier place to concentrate on reading or working or uh, or whatever. And, you know, along with that goes um, the range of spaces that we increasingly are seeing in libraries uh, that, that support other programming besides, um, you know, kind of traditional library programming. That's things like um, maker spaces and study rooms and co-working spaces. And, you know, there's a, uh, there's a greater variety of those spaces now, I think in public libraries than there used to be. And they, they similarly to the reading nooks uh, that we've tried to create, those also provide spaces at different scales for those kinds of activities, which, which are really important. You know, you brought up sort of the variety of spaces and the need to create different spaces for their evolving uses. You know, what, what follow or what impact do you think COVID is gonna have on the way people think about these spaces um, moving forward? I mean, I, I would say one, you know, you, you might initially intuitively think, oh, you know, small closed study room, not good in a pandemic situation. But I actually think in a way um, they're easier to manage because you, 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 if, you know, if you have a reservation system, for instance, and you say, I'm going to reserve this room for such and such a day, you know, for these hours, um, it, it's an it's a confined space that's easier to clean. Frankly, you can you you can schedule who's using it. You can schedule time in between those uses for cleaning. Um, and so, in in a way, I think they they almost lend themselves to a kind of pandemic model of of usage in a way that that a larger space uh, can't really, because then you know then you've got to get into um, uh, you know, distancing and cleaning becomes a little more difficult and uh, usage patterns are a little bit different. Uh, so in a way, I think those small spaces might lend themselves to a, a kind of pandemic uh, mold. Anything, Conrad, to add to, you know, what, what you're seeing or, or trends that you're looking for uh, implementing soon? You mean in, as it relates to the pandemic? Yeah, I think so. And, and coming out, hopefully. Yeah. Um, we have, we have talked with some of our, our colleagues in the architecture world about, about libraries and pandemics. In fact, the MBLC recently sort of hosted a, a little uh, seminar or, or, or a working a collaborative working session where we tried to toss out some ideas and some of the things that, you know, resonate and, and continue, we continue to come back to is, you know, the indoor air environment uh, is really critical, um, you know, better filtration systems, uh, operable windows, uh, more flexibility with, uh, with that. And hopefully we, we like to see that anyway in our libraries because we like the indoor outdoor connections that are made, but 
Um, I think indoor air quality and, and sort of that environment is, is critical. Um, I think, uh, as I mentioned before, you know, indoor, outdoor you know, spaces where, where programming in, in nice weather can spill outside will hopefully spawn, you know, more attention to um, the connections buildings have to their outdoor environments. Um, I think there are some interesting aspects to just, you know, book deliveries and, or, or, and drop off and pick up, you know, having sliding windows that allow, you know, that circ desk functionality to occur maybe out near the parking areas or, or you know, in, in certain weather or, or to address a, a future pandemic, those kinds of things we might see emerge, you know, going forward. But I think generally speaking, you know, my hope is that the qualities that we have been, you know, thinking about and, and working to implement in our libraries over the last 10 years will continue to be important, um, you know, for all of us going forward. So, you know, we hope that libraries are still going to be places that people want to come and use and enjoy and linger in. So um, none of that really has changed, but I think there will be some dynamics about indoor outdoor space and, and, and certainly air quality that are going to be, you know, really critical going forward. Uh, that's awesome. Something to look forward to. We, we, we like that, obviously. Um, you know, I, I, all I have left to say is thanks. I, I really enjoyed continuing our conversations, but also, you know, in some ways sharing you and, and the firm with um, people who are tuning in. Um, so, yeah, th thanks for joining us. I'll, I'll hand it off to Greg for a, a bit of a wrap. Yeah, it's, it's been a total pleasure, you guys. It's uh, uh, It was great to see you uh, in Norwell. It's, it's great to hear more about the work that you're doing. Um, for everyone else out there, thank you very much for, for watching Library Land Conversations. Uh, in the future, we'll be, we'll be sharing more. We have a, a, a few very exciting ones coming up. Um, please reach out, though, if you have any ideas for, for guests. If you'd like to be a guest yourself, uh, you can reach us at uh, info at librarylandproject.org. And we'd love to hear from you. Thank you all very much. And we'll speak soon. Thank you both. Good talk, talking with you. Always good to talk to you. Thank you, Adam and Greg. Appreciate it. Adam.